Church, as we continue to worship, I'm going to invite you to take your copy of God's Word, turn with me to two Bible passages that we're going to look at this morning. First, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, put your finger there. Also be ready to turn with me to Romans chapter 16 in the course of a few moments, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and then Romans chapter 16. Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers that are here so grateful for you. My mother-in-law is here and uh, Danielle and my wife and uh, wonderful moms. My mom was with us yesterday. I uh, gave her her Mother's Day gift and I was just reminded in that moment of growing up, I had two younger brothers and so three sons, mom, it, she, she didn't grow in, uh, when we were growing up, she, she didn't get the best of Mother's Day gifts. I think that would be the best way to describe that. And so for all of you moms here that are raising sons who are giving those gifts to you, uh, they get better. I'm grateful that I married Danielle, and Danielle's a wonderful daughter-in-law, and she gives, helps me give better gifts to my mom uh, for Mother's Day. One of those was yesterday. But all of the gifts that I've given uh, throughout the years, along with my brothers, they're, they're not as bad as some of the worst Mother's Day gifts that we can read about. There's a survey that was done, I was reading about it this last week, uh, 30 of the worst Mother's Day gifts that people actually have given. So that's the caveat, people have actually given these gifts here. So if you've given a fire extinguisher to your mother for Mother's Day, you're on that list right there. If you've given her a can of Pledge or a loaf of French bread or a bottle of ranch salad dressing or a bottle of hair dye, a flathead screwdriver, a calculator, spark plugs for your vehicle or a plunger, you've made that list right there. Three mothers that I want us to look at in scripture from two Bible passages all written by the Apostle Paul. And when Paul talks about these mothers, he doesn't talk first and foremost about the gifts that we bring to them, but rather the gifts that they give to us. Three mothers, two Bible passages. Hear the word of the Lord in 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 3. I thank God, whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, as I remember your tears, I long to see you, the you being Timothy, that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. Paul's writing a second letter to his son in the faith, Timothy. He's writing a second letter to his protege in the ministry, Timothy. Timothy at this point is about 30 years old. First met Timothy in Acts chapter 16, Paul did, on his second missionary journey. Timothy has got a unique biological heritage, a unique uh, ethnic heritage. His father was Greek, his mother was Jewish, his mother becomes a follower of Christ. We get to hear a little bit about the spiritual foundation that she laid for a son. Paul would have in mind Timothy being one who was exceptionally gifted to be able to uh, be a part of the apostolic ministry of Paul. He takes Timothy with him on his missionary journeys along with Silas. He plants Timothy in Ephesus as a pastor there, as an elder in Ephesus. And here Paul is celebrating Timothy's spiritual heritage. Here Paul is celebrating the way that God has sovereignly introduced Timothy to the faith. And notice what Paul doesn't say. Paul doesn't say, you remember Timothy? When I first met you and I laid for you that spiritual foundation that ultimately led to you becoming a Christian. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, hey, do you remember when Peter and James, the apostles, intersected with your life? No, he says, hey, you remember your grandmother and your mother? Do you remember the spiritual heritage that they laid for you? Do you you remember how they passed the baton of faith down to you and how you walked with Jesus even before I knew you because of the model and the example that you imitated in that Mount Rushmore of a grandmother and that Mount Rushmore of a mother, Eunice and Lois here? This is what Timothy is celebrating. 
Now, how do they pass the baton of faith down to Timothy? It's a good question. It's a question that actually Paul gives us some insight into just two chapters over in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. In verses 14 through 15, we read the the actual way that, that Lois and Eunice pass the baton of faith down to Timothy here. How do they do this? Because we want to do this, right? But it's for you, Paul says, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. This is his grandmother, Lois. This is his mother, Eunice. And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Eunice and Lois, they pass the baton of faith down to Timothy by cherishing the word of God. Uh, Timothy was well acquainted with the sacred writings. The sacred writings would have been the Old Testament for Timothy. You can imagine Eunice and Lois saying, hey, Timothy, come close to me. You can imagine before he goes to bed at night, you can imagine how Eunice and Lois would have said, hey, I want you to know about Abraham. I want you to know about Isaac. I want you to know about Jacob. I don't want you to forget, Timothy, how God took your spiritual forebears and they were in uh, slavery to the cruel, tyrannical hands of Pharaoh. And I don't want you to forget how God brought them and parted the Red Sea and brought them out of Egypt and set them free. Don't forget it, Timothy. You can imagine Eunice and Lois saying, Timothy, let us tell you about Saul. Let us tell you about David. Let us tell you about Solomon. Let's look at the prophets as they predicted the very coming of the Messiah. Timothy was steeped in the word of God. Timothy was well acquainted with the word of God. Any grandmother that is in this room here, any parent that is in this room here, has as their heartbeat a desire for their children to flourish. And there are a variety of ways for for your children, adoptively, biologically, there's so many ways for them to flourish. You want them to flourish physically. You want them to flourish educationally. You want them to flourish socially. You want them to flourish emotionally here. But note that there is no greater goal in your grandchild's life. There's no greater goal in your child's life than for them to flourish spiritually. We spend a whole lot of time, and I've been a part of it. There's so much, there's so much that is so good about what team our kids get on and what program our kids get. But I tell you this, the most important team that your kids can be a part of is the team that's called the family of God. And a Eunice and a Lois are passing the baton of faith designed for Timothy to be well acquainted with the word of God. And I can think back in my own life, how God has placed people in my life that have helped me to cherish the word of God. Early age, I can remember my mom on my bed, in my bedroom, having this children's Bible. And I can still see these indelible images of those early Old Testament stories that she would read to me. And how it laid this foundation that, that was birthed in my teenage years where God saved me. But she pointed me. I'm really grateful for a wife and a bride of 24 years. And now 17 of those years have been with children. And that goes by really fast. I know we've got some young parents in here, and I always heard people say to me, it goes by so fast, David, it goes by so fast, David, it goes by so fast. And now in these last couple of weeks, we've been taking our oldest son to campus visits, to school, and and I think to myself, where has the time gone? It's like, it's like that. I'm thankful for a bride, a mom who loves the word of God. As Daniel loves the word of God, it just overflows. And I can just think of the countless hours that I've been and been able to see the word of God flow forth from her. as She's read the word to our kids and she's helped our kids memorize the word of God. And she's helped our kids be exposed to the word of God. And she's sung the word of God over them. And she's prayed the word of God over them. Just being a Lois and being a Eunice, just as you are in these very pews here that you desire for your children to do so much in life. You want them to flourish. You want them to go off, but you want them to have a foundation that is fixed in what is unshakable. That is the unshakable good news of a sovereign God who loves them, loves them so much that he would send his son. 
And this makes a difference. This makes a difference not just in our pews here. It makes a difference not just in our neighborhoods here. It makes a difference in history. We can look back and see the Eunices and the Loises that have invested. And in, in we are who we are as a nation. We are where we are in 2023 because of those people that have come before us, that have poured into others. Just a couple years ago, I was reading Ronald White's really good biography on Abraham Lincoln. And I'm always reminded of this indelible characteristic of valor and strength and, and character, integrity. That, that Lincoln had. And, and the thing about Lincoln is, is there's so much that wasn't uh, laid out for him. I mean, there's no silver spoon for Lincoln. I mean, he actually lived through unspeakable poverty. He, I mean, he did not have a silver spoon in his mouth. He, he knew what it was to not be born with pedigree. He knew what it was to have tragedy in his life. He knew what it was to face difficulty. He had tremendous failures politically. But, you know, one thing that Lincoln had was this unshakable foundation of integrity and character that was laid through his mother and also his stepmother. I mean, you know this about Lincoln, do you not? Early in his life, it was his mother Nancy Lincoln, that would steep him in the family Bible, reading that to him, exposing that to him, so that when he thinks and when he writes and when he speaks, he's, he sort of has the King James just sort of flowing out of him. His mother tragically passes away. His father gets remarried. He gets remarried to Sarah Bush. Sarah Bush brings a lot of things into that marriage, a lot of things into Lincoln's life, but she brings three things, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Aesop's Fables, and her own Bible. And here you have Nancy Lincoln, and here you have Sarah Bush laying this foundation of character. And honest Abe, he gets it honestly because integrity and character were modeled to him through his Lois and through his Eunice. When you walk into the sanctuary, you, you look at the vision statement that it's not just our architectural design for us here. It, it is a part of who we are in the very ebb and the flow of what we do at Dawson to be found faithful as God's people. And what does faithfulness look like? Well, one pillar of faithfulness at Dawson is that discipleship is our focus. We want men and women to be found faithful as God's people, to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that we do that here at this church, not just now, but historically, it is a commitment to partner with parents because parents are the primary disciples of their children. And so I can say without any, I don't have to cross my fingers. I don't have to caveat this. I don't have to nuance this. I am so grateful that I, as a parent, get to raise my children in a church that values the passing of the baton in such a real way, such a prayerful, committed way. And I can say to you, I can say to you what you know and what you've experienced now and what you've experienced historically, that we are blessed. We are blessed with wonderful volunteers here at this church to be able to come alongside of families. We're blessed with wonderfully, exceptionally committed and gifted preschool ministers, kids ministers, and student ministers who have at their heartbeat to come alongside of our families so that the baton of faith can be passed, so that the Eunices and Loises can be encouraged in their walk to pass the baton of faith to their Timothys. Now, we know this, do we not? That families come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. There's not always a Eunice and a Lois there. And that leads us to the third mother. I, I told you we're going to have three mothers in two passages. We've looked at Eunice and Lois, but we'd be remiss as we're here on Mother's Day to just emphasize the biological mothers in our midst or the adoptive mothers in our midst. We would miss because we are the Dawson family of faith. We're part of the family of God. And as we're here today, we celebrate all the mothers. And some of those mothers are spiritual mothers. Listen to Paul's words in Romans chapter 16, starting in verse 12. It's a very curious passage. It's really easy to miss this. When you're reading Romans 16, Paul is ultimately saying, say hello, say hello, say hello, say hello, say hello, say hello. And we just sort of get uh, kind of lulled into there's not a whole lot going on here. But in verses 12 and verse 13, there's something that is, that is remarkable, especially for us to remember on Mother's Day. Greet those workers in the Lord, Trophina and Trophosa, 
Greet the beloved Persis who has worked hard in the Lord. This just gives you kind of a flavor of what he's doing in Romans 16. And then in verse 13, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. This last week, I was at a funeral of one of our church members' mothers, and her life was celebrated beautifully. And an indelible imprint that she had made upon her daughter and made upon her son. Her son actually was a minister, and the minister, her son, preached the funeral, and he chose this passage here. And I was just so deeply inspired by it as we came into Mother's Day. Now, in this passage here, it, it is easy for us to skip over this because there's a lot that we don't know. We don't even know the mother's name. Notice who Paul says. He says, greet Rufus's mother. Well, what's her name? Well, everybody knew her name, so Paul didn't have to name her name because she was known. Now, who is Rufus? Now, that might be mysterious to us. We're going to find out about Rufus at the end of Jesus's earthly ministry before his crucifixion. We have a dad whose name is Simon, and Simon is conscripted by the Roman soldiers to be able to come alongside of Jesus when he's overwhelmed with the task that is before him and he's physically exhausted, he's lost all the blood and they say, Simon, we want you to carry Jesus's cross. And Simon is named in Mark's gospel as the father of Alexander and who? Rufus. So here is Paul saying, greet this person, greet this person, greet this person. Hey, and by the way, greet Rufus's mother. And I love this. It seems to be kind of just a Holy Spirit aside. It seems as if Paul, just in the moment of inspiration, says, Oh, yeah, greet Rufus's mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Now, how was Rufus's mother a mother to Paul? And the answer is, We don't know. We don't know. Uh, We're going to have to use our sanctified imagination to take some guess. Maybe it is that the Apostle Paul in all of his journeys comes into contact with Simon and he comes into contact with Simon's wife, Rufus's mother, and he sits at her uh, knees and says, tell me more about Jesus. Tell me what it was like when your husband took up the cross of Jesus. Maybe it's Rufus's mother that just teaches Paul some firsthand information and knowledge of what it was like to see Jesus in flesh. Uh, may, maybe it was in all of Paul's missionary journeys that Rufus's mother was someone that just opened his house to Paul. May, maybe Rufus's mother just sort of proverbially always had the light on for Paul always had uh, the the bed ready for Paul, always had a meal ready for Paul. Maybe it was if in all of Paul's travels, he knew he always had a place that was open to him, a place where he could rest, a place where he could recoup, a place where he could move forward. Maybe that was the case. We we can even imagine that that Rufus's mother had a way to be able to, to get to the heart of Paul, that she would ask things of Paul that no one else would dare even imagine to ask. Like like a mother would be able to peer into the eyes of their daughter, the eyes of their son, and be able to get past all the formalities and get to the heart of something. And maybe Rufus's mother said, Paul, I see the circles right around your eyes. You're not sleeping enough, Paul. Are you getting enough rest, Paul? You're traveling a lot, Paul. I heard you and Barnabas are on the outs, Paul. Maybe, maybe God would lead you to mend that fence with Barnabas. Maybe it was Rufus's mother that could speak to, to Paul in a way that nobody else could. Maybe all the rest of Paul's associates would sit back and say, I tell you, I couldn't say that to him. We don't know. But what we do know is that when Paul comes to the end of his letter, he says, greet my spiritual mother. Tell her I said, hey. And as we're here on Mother's Day, we do the same. We can thank God for the spiritual mothers in our lives. We can thank God for the, for the mothers that are biological and adoptive mothers that love their children, but they always have just room to take others into their homes, others into their hearts. 
Are there others that, that don't have their own children biologically or adoptively, but they, they've been a, a mother. They've been a mother in a, a myriad of ways, pouring into the life of their Timothys, passing the baton of faith to them. Uh, there, there are mothers in the faith in our very midst who for years and decades have opened up the word of God and taught the next generation to love Jesus as Eunice and Lois did, as Rufus's mother did, passing the baton as they've opened the word and they said, cherish the word. There are other spiritual mothers that have, have walked and they walk with the next generation over coffee, over prayer, open their heart as they love, own, and mentor those that come after them. There are other mothers of the faith who you just know that they, when they say to you, I am praying for you, it's not just a cliche. It, it's, it's not just words. You know that it's true soul commitment to you. I mean, sometimes the spiritual mothers are not mothers that we know physically or even meet. Sometimes it's through their teaching ministry. Sometimes it's through the books that they write and the indelible imprint that they make on our walk with Jesus Christ as we follow Jesus and they let us see Jesus better. They're spiritual mothers that we know by name and they're spiritual mothers that only we know through their writings and their books and their influence. But all the same, as we're gathered this morning, we thank God for Eunice. We thank God for Lois, but we also thank God for Rufus's mother, who ultimately is a spiritual mother to Paul. So as we come to the end of our message today, we pass the baton of faith by cherishing the word of God. But also this morning, I want us to hold on to a theological truth in our remaining moments here, that we also pass on the baton of faith by trusting in God's sovereign care. Now, this is a theological truth that I want us to hold on to here. When we pass on the baton of faith in the next generation, we are called to model the faith. We are called to pray for our children. We're called to lead them in such a way that they would see Jesus clearly and that they would desire to seek after him and to love him, to learn from him and to be a disciple to him. But you know what we can't do is we cannot force their hands to grip the baton of faith. No matter how much we love them, no matter how much we pray for them, we cannot take that baton and say, hey, give me your hands and then take their fingers and one by one cement their fingers to the baton. They must individually take up the baton of faith. Now we seek the Lord. We seek the Lord for their salvation. We seek the Lord for them to walk with Jesus faithfully. We want to model this and love them in such a way, but they must receive that baton. And you know that that can be a precarious pass. It can be a precarious pass that is, that is ripe with, with many who will drop the baton. There are many who will reject the baton. There are many who grow up in, in families where the, the loved ones above them, their mom and dad, they didn't even carry the baton of faith. But they become faithful followers of Christ. And there are others whose parents carried faithfully the baton of faith. But for a variety of reasons, that son, that daughter, that grandchild says, not for me. And we see this in scripture. I mean, we, see, we see Samson who has a mom and dad who pray for his birth, offer sacrifices for him. They commit in a way that is impossible for us to imagine. And Samson does what with that spiritual heritage? He drops it. He lives a life of promiscuity and foolishness that leads to his demise and his capture. He has parents who are passing the baton and Samson says, no. And we also see in scripture, those who, who do not pass the baton of faith, that ultimately there's this wonderful spiritual heritage that they live out of. And you can see this in, in Saul and Jonathan's relationship. Saul, when he's appointed as king, is a man who walks after God. But as you walk through his uh, dynasty and you walk through his kingship, he is overwhelmed with envy, overwhelmed with jealousy. He has a murderous rage for Jonathan's best friend, who is David, and seeks to kill him. And Jonathan is not a person who is predestined to follow in the footsteps of his father. 
And so we see Saul not passing down the baton of unfaithfulness to his son Jonathan. We see Jonathan taking up the baton of faithfulness to David, even in spite of the faithlessness of his father. And so we know this. We know this as parents, that we pray for our children. We pray for those as spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers in this room that God has given us the ability to intersect with. But we cannot force them to follow Jesus as much as we'd want to as much as our soul cries out for that because we want that for them, they must individually choose. And one of the great truths just to hold on to is, is while we are called to run the race of faith and called to pass the baton of faith to the next generation, the great news is, is that we have a God who desires the salvation of our children more than we do. That as much as you desire for your children to run with Jesus and to love Jesus, you know who outpaces your love for that? It is Jesus who is seeking them. It is Jesus who loves them. And as, we, as parents run this race, we must trust in a God alone who desires to be a friend to your child. And we just need to hold on to this wonderful truth that we don't run alone. He's with us every step of the way. One of the most encouraging stories of a mother is a story that's an old story. And when I say old story, I'm not talking about a century old. I'm talking about centuries old. I'm talking about fifth century old. Her name was Monica. And she was a faithful mother to her son who was named Augustine. And Augustine, as a teenager, lived it up. He is the example of the prodigal son teenager. He comes to this place where he's running away from home, getting on a boat, headed to Rome, never again to see his mother. His mother's a faithful follower of Christ. She is on her knees, weeping, praying for God to thwart the plans of her son, to to capsize the boat, whatever it takes to get Augustine to come home, to dock the boat, to not enable Augustine to be able to get on that boat. But nevertheless, he's able to sail away. And Augustine, who eventually becomes a follower of Christ, he writes what we know to be really the first autobiography ever. It was called Confessions. And in it, Augustine, as an adult, reflects on his his mother's faithful prayers and the way that God surpasses in answering them in a way that she could never imagine. Listen to Augustine's words. And what does she beg of you, my God, with all those tears... If not that you would prevent me from sailing, but did not do, but you did not do as she asked you. Instead, in the depth of your wisdom, you granted the wish that was closest to her heart. For she saw that you had granted her far more than she used to ask in her tearful prayers. You converted me to yourself so that I no longer placed any hope in this world, but stood firmly upon the rule of faith. And you turn my mother's sadness into rejoicing, into a joy far fuller than her dearest wish, far sweeter and more chaste than any she had hoped to find. What a wonderful comfort to know that God was with her son even when he was running. And what a wonderful hope for you to hold on to because I have a feeling there's some grandparents in this room today There there are some parents in this room today that when you close your eyes, the image that comes before you are the images of sons and daughters that maybe are spiritual prodigals. And what a great truth for you to hold on today, that no matter how far they run away, they never get out of the zip code of God's sovereign care. He is with them even in the midst of your tears and even in the midst of your prayers. And he desires far more than we could ever pray for or ever imagine for our own children. So whatever those images are of sons and daughters, no to all the Eunices and the Loises, to the Rufus mother that is in this very sanctuary today, no that God is with you, loves you, and loves your children more than you can even 
imagined. Let us pray.